Emily, and this is Caitlin, and we're the co-founders of ATX TV. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual screening and conversation with the showrunner and cast of the new Paramount Plus original comedy, Tulsa King, a show that we are very excited to dig into. You know, Emily, there's a lot of TV these days. There is a whole lot. Sometimes it's hard to keep track of what to watch, where to watch, who to watch. We would know. And so when you hear names like Taylor Sheridan, Terrence Winter, Sylvester Stallone in the same sentence, not to mention the incredible cast members we have joining us today, you really have no choice but to pull up a chair and give it some attention. You know, pull up a chair, a couch, a Lincoln Navigator, whatever you're working with. From Yellowstone and Boardwalk Empire to The Sopranos and The Wire and on and on, the pedigree of this creative team and cast is truly a TV fan stream. And we could not be more excited to dive into the world of Tulsa King with this amazing panel. Thank you to our partners at Paramount Plus for making the screening and conversation possible and for introducing us to one of our favorite and unexpectedly very funny new shows. We hope you'll continue to watch along with us each week as new episodes are released every Sunday exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. With that, I think it's time to turn over to our moderator and get the show on the road. Please welcome Emily Longretta from Variety. Hi, guys. I am so excited to be to be moderating this conversation today for Tulsa King, and I don't want to keep anyone waiting. So I'm going to first uh, introduce our co-creator, writer, executive producer, Terrence Winter. Oh, there I am. Hi. There you are. And then next we have AC Peterson. Hello. Followed by Dominic Lombardazzi, Vincent Piazza, and last but definitely not least, Max Casella. Guys, thank you all so much for taking the time to do this today. Congrats on the incredible show. Um, Terrence, I'm I'm gonna start with you. I feel like it's only fitting to start at the top here and kind of ask how how this this came about for you, how you got involved with this. And if you had worked with Taylor before, or, or you know, just kind of kind of set the scene for us. Sure. Um, about a year and a half ago, I got a call from my agent who said that Taylor Sheridan had written a pilot about a an aging mobster who gets uh sent to kind of the middle of nowhere. Originally it was Kansas City. Uh, and he said, you know, Taylor has one or two other shows, of course, and he couldn't possibly run this. So it was Taylor's idea to reach out to me and see if I wanted to partner up and sort of take this ball and run with it. So I read the pilot and then they told me, oh, by the way, Sylvester Stallone is attached to this as well. I said, great. Where do I sign? Uh, it was the pilot was really fun. Uh, basically follows uh, Sly's character, who is an aging mobster who, again, gets sent to the middle of nowhere. I made some changes. We changed the venue from Kansas City to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which felt even more remote, kind of changed the backstory a little bit where he was just getting out of prison after 25 years and is really at odds with his mob family, uh, particularly his old uh, friend, uh, Pete, played by A.C. Peterson, and more, uh, more at odds with Pete's son, Chicky played by Dominic. So we uh, made some changes, uh, got it going, and the rest is history. I mean, I I think AC and Dominic. I want to I want to kind of shift to you guys because the dynamic between the two of you and the dynamic with Sylvester Stallone is just so interesting. So how did you guys kind of find these these characters? How did you kind of tap into that? AC, let's start with you. I yeah. Uh... I think he's presented as being very ill, and I and I always wondered, oh, is this just is this just a con, because he wants to sort of uh, take the burden off, so it's like some people do they exaggerate their illness, and so this and thinking about what is my concern of putting my son, who seems to be, you know, why is he named Chicky? Is it like Chick Chick Chick? Come here, Chicky. Like what has he done in the past, and why have I uh, maybe scarred him and? My relationship with Stallone, because it's about honor, but it's also about power. It's also about holding on to that power. So those are all the kind of things um, that I brought to the table to kind of enrich it for me and uh, sort of validate what, what the hell am I doing there? What is the significance of what I'm doing? This very powerful man who is on the sort of on the slide down or is it just a matter of uh, you know uh, just uh, call me when you need me kind mm -hmm. of a thing so that's that's uh, that's my process there so. I love that. Dominic what about you uh, for me it was more um, just kind of tapping into uh, this new generation of organized crime I mean Chicky just represents what the decline is uh, he can never uh, 
possibly be uh, who Dwight Manfredi is. And I think internally he knows that. And I always kept that in the back of my mind is in the forefront, want to be like him, feel like you are stronger than him. But deep down inside, I knew completely inferior to him. I can never, I can never be him. And I think there was always, I always felt um, I would go to work and I wouldn't like my father. Even though I'm I'm protecting him, I feel like I have the interest uh, for him, but I want to be broken away from that, kind of emancipated. And uh, he just wants to, um, I just had to present like I was stronger, but I know deep down inside I can never be that type of man. Mm. And that was more or less the mindset for yeah. me. Yeah. For sure. I think those complexities come out right in the beginning too. So kudos to you for, for being able to, to show that. Um, Completely insecure. <laughs> Very insecure. Yeah. So, and for yeah. me, part of it was to how to how to pr protect my son from this formidable figure, this colleague of mine, who is <clears throat> a powerful uh, force. So that that was going on as well in terms of uh, pr protecting my son or protecting the business from somebody who could conceivably come in and perhaps take over. Yeah, mm -hmm. Vince, let's let's shift to you. How did you tap into? into Vince. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there was uh, a, a part of Vince is uh, a bit materialistic and uh, he leveraged uh, a relationship with the boss's son that he's had for a number of years. I feel like in some ways to Dom's point about the decline, he's a product of inheritance. And, uh, you know, with Dwight getting out of prison, there's uh could lay claim to business or things that enrich me, uh, so it's a bit threatening, uh, and uh, we're not quite sure who's coming out of the cage. So um, you know that was that was fun to work with, and and uh, and then obviously there's a shared history with Dwight, who was senior to us as we were kids coming up. Uh, so there's that to also deal with uh, the line of respecting someone, but also you know feeling like their time is up. Yeah, absolutely. Max, how about you? Uh, my take on on Armand was that, um, like these other guys, he he inherited this world that he grew up in. You know, all of my father, my father, my uncles, and they're all probably in in this uh, criminal organization. But that I personally didn't have any kind of interest or killer instinct to to be to rise up very high in the world and i always imagined armin just being you know a guy who was good with with gambling and numbers and they they just put him in charge of the sports book because you know the guy just didn't have it in him to be a mob guy to be able to to take a life or do anything like that and when we meet armin he's in tulsa we don't really know why at the, at, at the this early juncture but uh, I don't know what I can say as far as more than that. Probably not much, but um, I feel like Armand is a guy through the course of this story. He's been living most of the last 20 years or 19 years as, in the closet as a, a lie, uh, running from his past, pretending to be somebody he's not, something he's not. Uh, he's his wife and kids. They don't know anything about his past and he's pretending like his past didn't happen. And he's, and he's kind of looking over his shoulder all the time. And then when he sees Dwight, the shopping mall, his whole house of cards comes crumbling down upon him. And this starts him and without giving anything away. This starts him on a road uh, where things tend to, where his comfortable um, fake Ex little existence under the radar existence he's now forced to deal with the truth of who he is and where he's from and who he's where he comes from uh in the form of Dwight Manfredi unexpectedly against all odds showing up in Tulsa Oklahoma of all places and it sort of he spirals from there yeah. I, I love I love hearing you guys talk about your character. You make me sound like a much better writer than I actually am. This is I, I had no idea these are all so rich, deep, uh, thoughtful people. You guys, that's really awesome. 
<laughs> That's the job. Thank you. You're very good at it, all of you. <laughs> well, Terrence, I'm curious for you. I mean, you have you have experience telling these kind of mafia kind of stories. Um, how did you kind of take those experiences into this? And how does this differ from the stuff that you've done in the past? Well, the, the thing that jumped out at me right away, there was a couple of things that intrigued me. There's something really interesting uh, about taking a character in the twilight of his years who is now questioning all of his life's choices. Uh, we meet Dwight, he's just getting out of jail after 25 years, and he starts to realize that the life he chose, the choices he made, the oath he took, uh, really might not be what it what he thought it was when he went in. And he's got a very limited amount of time and a very limited amount of li limited skill set and very limited conflict resolution skills to sort of take this information and move forward with the rest of his life and try to reconcile his past choices, make something of the time he has left, and then rectify the sins of the past. So that was really fascinating to me. Also, the idea of taking a guy like that, a dyed in the wool New York mob capo, and dropping him into the middle of Tulsa was, you know, just the, the opportunities are endless. I mean, it's just it's it's the ultimate fish out of water story. Uh, you know, a guy that looks like that in a silk suit that looks like Sylvester Stallone walking into a cowboy bar, uh, you know, might as well have a spotlight on him. And that was, you know, and he knows he's a stranger and he knows he's got to comport himself differently. <laughs> yet he's still a gangster, uh, you know, so for for those various reasons and then you know the idea of, of of mixing two tried and true genres the the crime genre with the western was just you know just something i couldn't pass up so it was just really like going to work in a playground every day yeah absolutely i mean speaking of that a little there's also i don't think you know if you see the list of all of your your names and you see Sylvester Stallone's name and and uh, you know Taylor Sheridan you don't automatically think comedy and i would laughed out loud in the episodes that i've seen so thank you I'm, absolutely i'm curious for any of you who want to answer how how doing that genre and kind of mixing in that comedy what that experience was like for you guys I, I went in. I wasn't sure it was a comedy. OK, I found that out later in the day. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think it's funnier uh, if you go. I mean, for me, I think it's funnier to go in like that. And you tweet it like it's as serious as hell. And then later you find out, oh, I think that helps you to be funny rather than trying to be funny. You're trying to be serious as a heart attack. Right? <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, dark comedy is funniest when it's played seriously. I mean, it's yeah. just the the situation is just inherently absurd. You know, you take this guy, you don't have to try to be funny. If you just take a guy like that and drop him into Tulsa, it's going to be funny. It's just really about behavior. It's really about being real and uh, honest and watching these human beings try to navigate each other. And that's where the comedy is. It's not uh, traditional sitcom setup punchline comedy. It's the comedy of circumstance and just people being thrown into a mix together who shouldn't normally wouldn't be together and just watching how they behave and watching the absurdity play out. And that's where that's and that's why all of these guys are so great at it because they're they're not nobody's trying to be funny, but everybody is inherently funny. Yeah. So it worked. Absolutely. Had any of you been to Oklahoma or spent time in Oklahoma before? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Terrence, have you? I, I went there. Like I went there on a three-day research trip uh, to Tulsa, and uh, I thought, "Oh, great! I'll spend three days walking around the city." And about two hours after I got there, I was like, "Okay, um, I think I got it." <laughs> And I said, now what do I do for the next three days? Uh, that's that's not quite true. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, it, you know, I, I got it pretty quickly. But and the one thing I did stumble onto. Uh, uh, was this thing called the center of the universe, which is a little acoustical anomaly where you stand in the middle of this circle of bricks and you speak and your voice comes back at you louder than the way you spoke. And we ended up working that into an episode that worked out really nicely. But uh, yeah, it was it was a, it was it was great taking the time to do that because, you know, it, it, I can only have imagined what Tulsa and Oklahoma City, where we did a lot of our shooting would be like, and, you know, just just spending time there. And, and I do have to say, and a shout out to the people of Oklahoma, they're absolutely lovely, uh, could not have been more welcoming, great steak. I think my cholesterol level is finally normalizing again after being home for two months. Uh, but we, we had a great time. And it was really, really a pleasure to shoot there. 
Yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask any of you guys who want to share if you have any experiences of how it was filming there, because it is such a random, I mean, we see we see TV shows film in certain cities over and over again. We don't get a lot of Tulsa. So I'm curious how what that experience was like being in Oklahoma and filming there. It allowed us to really be, you know, to to uh, to to become a little family because, you know, we we were all like fish out of water there. And uh, we were we just became very close. You know, we'd all go, you know, play pickleball. We'd all like sit by the pool on, on downtime. We'd all go out to dinner, whatever it was. It was, it was like a really great kind of uh, bonding thing because there was nothing else outside of the show going to work every day really to do once you've like done a few, you know, museums or whatnot. But yeah. we had each other, which was fantastic. Yeah. Did anybody else want to? Vinny, Vinny would cook uh, lasagnas. Fucking amazing. Yeah, his house. It was fun. We had a lot of dinners to Max's point. We had a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of fun in our downtime. It was like summer camp, you know, to be away uh from the city, the hustle and bustle of New York. And what Terry had said uh, earlier is that the people could not have been nicer. Uh really welcoming um place to go and shoot. And um and getting around the city is incredibly easy uh so you know there wasn't uh you know traffic or delays you don't have to get up two hours before your call just to try and like navigate congestion uh it was just a, a wide open road and a beautiful place to shoot Amazing. i don't think i'm talking out of school i hope i'm not but i will tell a story without naming names a couple of our cast members who look like stereotypical new york mob guys walked into a weed store a cbd store in oklahoma city and, you know, three of them or four of them lined up together and walked in to, you know, just to inquire about, you know, potentially, uh, you know, becoming customers. And the owner came flying in and said, hey, hey, can I, can I help you guys? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're we're just here to, you know, to check it out. And he's like, who are you? And they said, well, we're actors. And the guy's like, oh, my God, I was I thought the mafia was coming in to take off my store. <laughs> so kind of a little bit of art imitating life there. Uh, they said, no, we're right. We're here acting on that new show with Sylvester Stallone. And I was like, oh, thank God. I really <laughs> thought I was actually about to be taken over by the mob. So but I don't know who those actors were. I don't remember who who that happened to, but you'd have to ask. <laughs> if, anyone here wants, if anyone here wants to volunteer that it was them, you can you can admit it here. This is a safe space. <laughs> wasn't me. Hey, um, I, 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 I wanted to say what, what to me. I arrived... You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think we can all <laughs> I I I sense there was still the, the, the old west still exists there, that even though it's these big cities, that there's some undercurrent, there's some code that early on I found a little frightening is I didn't know quite how to how to behave, that there was a, a mode of behavior there that if you if you sort of stepped out of line. You'd you'd get a look, or you would feel like you were in a dangerous. Isn't quite the word, but you felt like you're in a slightly dangerous situation in terms of maybe doing a faux pas of some kind. That's what I felt too. I was in a van once with another guy from New York, and the driver. We were stuck behind somebody who was just being really slow, and the other New Yorker said, "You know, give him a honk on the horn." And the driver stopped and turned at him and said, "Yeah, we don't do that here." <laughs> yeah, like that, like that. There yeah, you go. Like, like well, how that. does anybody get anywhere? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah. There's a code. There's still a code. Yeah, a little thing like that. I was locked in the. I, I was having trouble with getting out of the garage with my uh, pass key, and oh, I had God. to call. I had to call a, a garage attendant on the on the buzzer, and I was just like, just talking like I'm talking now, a little bit of heightened, like, yeah, hi, how you doing? Uh, my card's not working, so I need somebody to come down and, and uh, but. <laughs> The response I got was like, you need to call back when you learn some politeness. Click. Like that. Like that. And I, stu yeah. I was stuck in a fucking garage. Excuse me. I was stuck in a garage. And I had to wait like 20 minutes to call back and pretend I was somebody else. <laughs> Have you learned to be polite now, I hope? I was being polite, Terry. It was just, it was just you know, the, 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 that heightened thing of like, yeah, I, I, I totally get it. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm stuck here in, uh, you know. <laughs> I was like that kind of thing yeah if yeah. you go sort of a new york which would be normal here i'm in man now 
Yeah, it doesn't doesn't fly. Yeah, absolutely. Like, Run of the mill New York neuroticism <laughs> is totally misinterpreted there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Take it very I'm, personally. Yeah, of course. It's a different a different world out there. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you guys hope people get out of this because I think there's a different a couple of different things that can kind of come out of that. Whoever would like to speak, um, Dom, I want to. Well, let's let's start with you. What do you hope that people get out of this? Uh, well, I hope people get the comedy. <laughs> um, what? Well, well, honestly, I, 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 I want people to watch. Sylvester Stallone and see him do something that he hasn't done in a long time, to be perfectly honest. I mean, um, working with him, uh, I was very up close to seeing what he was doing. Um, I, I think he's just going to show so many colors and, and I hope he, uh, reaps the rewards for it. Um, I just, uh, other than, you know, the story itself and people, you know, finding this story interesting, the, the whole fish out of water thing, this whole city, the New York storyline, the mobster, the him, you know, uh, connecting with his family, him trying to rebuild his family, him trying to find himself. I just, I think what he does in these 10 episodes is something beautiful. And and Terrence just gave him everything. And I think Sly took the ball and, and ran with it. And hopefully people see that. Yeah. He's never done con this is the first comedy for Sylvester Stallone, right? No, Tango and Cash. And oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Oscar. And he, and Oscar. 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 The only other time he played a mobster, but it was a comedy. That didn't count really. Yeah. <laughs> this counts. This counts. Though. Stop and my mom will shoot. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I mean, what's what's interesting, further what Dom said, I mean, you know, you've got, uh, he, he shows such a wide range of colors here and has got so much depth and there's there's comedy and there's uh, pathos and there's, he's got monologues, you know, you, you've never, you know, he's got page and a half monologues, which you, you know, you could, you've never seen Rambo and or Rocky do anything like that, you know, which is, you know, how most people think of Sly and which is so great. I mean, I think within the first five minutes of this show, he reminds you who Sylvester Stallone is. If you didn't know, he grabs you by the throat and you're like, oh, right. That's why this guy is an international superstar. He is, you know, I'm, I'm excited too. you know, to, to have the world see what it is he can do. And, uh, you know, he, he's just, you know, I defy you to take your eyes off this guy. Yeah. A hundred percent. Did anyone else want to want to talk a little about just anything that people, you know, can take out of this? I do think that the story has so many different layers in a way that in different characters that each person can relate to, so which is always something that's nice to see on TV. I, I'd i say uh, the absurdity of life to teach people a little more, because in my life, too, the more I realize that it's absurd, the more it helps. So I think that's part of it too, or the gift or the lesson or, you know, increase the facility to understand the absurdity of life itself. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if I'm, if I'm right, a few of you have worked with Terrence before. Yes, Terrence, you've worked with a few of these before. What was that experience like kind of coming back together? For me, it was like getting the gang back together. It was, you know, I've got, you know, this this uh, repertoire uh, company of of uh, gangsters and or, you know, crazy New York type guys who I absolutely adore. Uh, you know, it, it's it just it just I you know, in terms of the work itself, I mean, I know every one of these guys can just knock it out of the park. And then personally, selfishly, I love them all. So it's just like going to work with your friends every day. AC I had not worked with before, but uh when we were talking about casting Pete, I said there was this guy in Molly's game. Uh, with Jessica Chastain, who did not have any dialogue. But Jessica Chastain opened the door, and this guy comes barreling into the apartment and beats the hell out of her. I oh. said, I don't know who that actor is. I forget his name. But if this guy can talk, I'm casting him as Pete because he's so formidable and scary and real that I, re I remembered him all for all that time. And then so he said, oh, yeah, that's A.C. Peterson. I'm like, oh, of course. And uh it turns out he can talk uh, really well uh, and uh, was just perfect as Pete and uh, just had such a great 
uh, chemistry with with Dom and 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 Vince and and Sly. Uh, so he's now part of that family I just described. So it's it's uh, it's such a joy to be able to do this at all, and an indescribable joy to be able to do it with your friends. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Vince, I was going to ask you: Is have you what? Why did this kind of stand out for you? Because obviously you have experience doing these kind of mobster, gangster kind of shows. So I'm curious why this one, why this one came out a little bit different. Um, first at the gate to work with Terry again, which I had expressed in the past that I'd like leap, like ready to go. Uh, and then uh, to be really honest, to get punched in the face by Sylvester <laughs> Stallone in the opening minutes, I didn't need to read anymore. I was like, that's, <laughs> that's plenty. Uh, so I was ready Sign me up, as Terry had said. I, I'm I'm ready to go, and then you know, let's see how it all unfolds. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty good good opening scene to be part you should be in. I would say. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> all right, you know, it's not how it starts; it's how it ends. But this is <laughs> this is uh, this is fun. This is fun I remember story. on the day I said uh, to Vinny, I said, "Dude, you just got knocked out by Rocky." I yeah. said, that's pretty <laughs> fucking amazing. You're in a long list. You, Clubber <laughs> Lang. The uh, Russian Apollo guy, Reed, Ivan Drago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I've joined this like fraternity. Yeah, this elite, um, very rare club. That's right. That's yeah, right. Absolutely. Was, uh, very satisfying. It was so funny. I remember we would go back to the monitor and look at you come into frame, just boom. <laughs> <laughs> I chanced that the first day, um, and it took me a minute to realize that. Whenever it's easy, it's good. If it's difficult, there's a problem with the writing or the other actors or whatever. But it was so easy. And then I realized, oh, these are all, you know, New York actors, right? Which is, this is my spiritual life study with Stella Adler, Brando's teacher, and also my my background. So that that was something that was just so lush and so lovely, like a warm bath to go into, uh, to be working with these fabulous, uh, uh, you know, New York actors. Thanks. Yeah. Guys. I, I think a lot of us, I, I, I know I can speak for Vincent, Max, uh, you know, I think selfishly, we signed on to this. It was like, hey, okay, yeah, the script, okay, yeah, whatever. Oh, okay, it's Terry. Okay, it's how I'm going to be working with Max. I'm going to be working with Vince, uh, working with Kyle Davino. Okay, that's great. Uh, oh, Sly's in it. That's great. <laughs> Alan was in it. Great. These are all people. See, here's the thing. You do this long enough and you want to work with people because you could potentially be working with these people for five, six, seven years. And you want it to be smooth because you are sacrificing a lot to relocate to another state, be away from your family, you're sacrificing your time with your family, you're sacrificing your time with your friends, your livelihood, and you don't want it to be a problem. So I think selfishly, I think a lot of us did it for that reason as well. I know I did. No, very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Taryn, something you said at the top was that you, when you came on, you changed the location to Tulsa. What what was the why was that? Why was the original location not the one you went with? Um, well, the, the, well, the whole premise is that uh, Sly's character is going to a place that doesn't have a mafia right. history, and Kansas City uh, has a long and storied mob history. If you uh, actually, if you remember the movie Casino, and the mm -hmm. guys are in Las Vegas and they're calling back home, they're actually calling back home to Kansas City. So. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, there's already mobsters in Kansas City. So I wanted to find a place that was even more remote that had no mafia presence whatsoever. whatsoever. So I, I kind of I'm horrible at geography. So I actually had to pull up a map on the uh, on the computer and look at the country. It's like, oh, Oklahoma, that sounds great. And then Tulsa, you know, again, I had never been there, but just Tulsa felt to me like it was going to be exactly what it turned out to be, which is just the the antithesis of new york uh and for a guy like uh like dwight that was the perfect location there's just there's crime certainly but nothing like the organized crime that he's he comes from so it was the perfect place to drop him yeah absolutely um max i want to ask you for these you know obviously you are your scenes right now in the early episodes that we don't want to spoil anything are kind of solo you kind of talking people developing you know what's going to happen next and kind of setting up that scene. Is there anything that you can kind of hint at as to when 
he will come face to face with Dwight. That's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> I don't know when it's going to happen now. Okay. I don't know. Uh, that's a question for Terry because I don't it, know. It's where going to happen, gonna... and it's going to happen in a big way, very, very shortly. I will say that. I mean, I, it used to be like a break it down episode number, but now everything's been juggled. So I don't know what, where that's actually ending up now. So right, I'm in the dark as much as anybody else. It's something that's such a strong theme throughout this is this family code that, you know, obviously that's the most important thing to Dwight, but it's also the most important thing to most of your characters too. I'm curious if you guys can talk a little bit about if if each of these characters really operate that way, if it's family first before everything else, and kind of what how that how important that is to each of the characters. Um, whoever wants to go first. Max, let's start with you. I'm not sure how um I think Armin legitimately adores his sons. Um his his wife, I don't know exactly how well that's going um again without i can't talk about story, yeah. story points so uh, but armin is just basically hiding out in his life in plain sight hiding in plain sight making as little bumps as possible flying under the radar he's got a very ordinary family in a very ordinary house on a very ordinary street he works at the ranch with the with the managing the horses and all and uh I think he's kind of uh, as like he's sort of like the Walking Dead. He's not really living, yeah. Uh, which is why it's such a great place to start yeah. with a character. Yeah. Right? And from there, you know, this bomb goes off in his very safe little life <clears throat> created for himself. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how how much of a family man Armand really is. Although I do believe he adores his children. Yes. Maybe once upon a time, he and his wife had something good going on but it's certainly whatever it is 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 on on life support yeah vincent what about you because obviously that's the, a huge theme with your character uh yeah i think um you know again to bring it back to what we had spoken about earlier is like this is a a system that once had oaths blood oaths uh our family above your personal family and we're seeing something in decline and decay to such a degree that uh, it feels more like a pirate ship than it does a family. Uh, there's um, there's a, a selfishness um, that I feel, uh, you know, maybe the character isn't aware of, um, but uh, I think exists there. And, um, and yeah, uh, it's hard to see... Um, where his personal boundaries are there are only little flickers and flashes of that in the show with his with his actual family but um hopefully we'll we'll get to see more mm -hmm. absolutely um I, ac how about you yeah go ahead. yeah i'd say uh you know family is not necessarily all flowers and puppies and rainbows and stuff too and i think to come from such uh, uh i would say there's damage there there's sadomasochism there there's a way that you may even use your old children or your my parents were great by the way this is no reference to my mom and my dad but uh i think about what 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 causes psychopathy what causes these people to have the ability to kill mercilessly to torture mercilessly to hold uh, to that code of honor to the point where uh, if you're outside of it, you don't matter. It's the ability to be a killer. Yeah. I couldn't do it unless I was protecting somebody. Even then, that would be a stretch. But to do this as a business, because the bottom line, that's part of it. That's part of power is you is to have the ability to kill someone unless they comply with what you want from them. And if they don't. And this could apply also to your own, like your own son or your own kids. What is the degree to which you can be absolutely cold hearted? That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. There's a fun hypocrisy, too, that I um, um, forgot for a moment. Um, but, you know, when you someone gets out of prison and there's a system that's supposed to be in place of government, that's going to give them something, uh, some kind of severance. Uh, and for instance, Vince, who doesn't want to honor the system 
but the second he's in a position where he needs the system, he, you know, you cry bloody murder uh, for the system to work on your behalf. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's it's fun to think of, um, you know, uh, the hypocrisy in it and and how these characters uh, see the world. Dominic, how about you? Um, you know, pretty much in line with what what Vincent and AC said, um, just, you know, the decline of the so-called family. I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't call it a family anymore. I, I mean, as far as Chicky concerned, it's all about power uh, based on his insecurity, um, trying to uh, create something completely new, kind of get old, rid of the old regime his his you know his his dad and try to create something new for himself you know this is po probably a life that he didn't he want he didn't want any part of you know some some of these some people some guys who are in this life have no choice they just it it just it's 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 just part of this progression you know be a doctor no you're not going to be a doctor you know college no forget about college mm -hmm. i want you to go around the block go to jimmy pick up the 50 grand bring it to Tommy. And that's where it all starts. And I think Chicky is a product of that. And, um, and all that insecurity, all that anger, that's where it stems from. And, uh, and, and you most likely see that in some of the later episodes, but like Max said, things have changed. And so I don't know where things are placed, but, uh, you, you know, um, the, 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 the character you see in the first episode is not the character that you see in the 10th episode. And I can guarantee that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Terrence, I want to kind of end with you. I, I know we've, we've talked about the layout of these episodes and how kind of, how, how far ahead are you planning? I'm always curious about this. Are you thinking five seasons down the road. I mean, you talked about this in the beginning when you sign on to a TV show, there's always that thought that you want to be around people you like, because this could be a long, a long job, or it could be short. I mean, you just never know in the world we're in now. So I'm curious how, how far ahead you start thinking about those stories. I mean, you know, I, when I start plotting a series, I like to sort of flash forward to what might be, where does this character ultimately end up? And I sort of have an idea for Dwight and God willing, that won't be till five or six seasons in. Uh, that said, you know, I, that, once I get that settled, I take it one season at a time. So we got through season one. I have an idea where we're heading in season two. But beyond that, I really don't know. Uh, you know, it's sort of like driving from Los Angeles to New York. I know eventually we're going to end up in New York. Right now we're only we're just passing Vegas. So we're we're we got a long road ahead of us. So I've gotten us that far. Now I got to figure out what's the next uh, leg of the trip. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. I want to remind everyone that's watching that new episodes of Tulsa King drop on Sundays on Paramount Plus. And for more information on ATX, you can head to atxtv.co plus the atxfestival.com for ticket sales and season 12 information. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see everybody. Bye.